Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you. Well, books have been my passion for as far back as I can remember. After my husband Rodney and I, you can see him here in the photo, after we got married, he said he thought there was something wrong with me because he had never been around someone who read so much. Well, uh, motherhood and marrying have uh, limited the time and energy that I have for reading, but books still inspire me so much. In fact, I would say that books have shaped me. You know, as we all grow and change and explore, ask questions, about ourselves, who we are, what it means to be a woman, an American, a black person, or even a human being. You know, I think I have been exploring the answers to all those questions throughout my life through reading books. A German historian, Rolf Engelstein, popularized the uh, notion that there was a reading revolution in 18th century uh, Europe. And then Steven Pinker followed up on that idea uh, and said that really he linked that revolution to the rise of the novel, which really expanded uh, humanitarian ideals because people were able to read about other humans' experiences. And then political scientist Benedict Anderson followed up on those ideas and said that he thinks that the, uh, the words on paper and thoughts expressed uh, actually help to build and create communities. So let's start at the beginning. Mr. Pine's Purple House was my favorite book when I started reading, when I learned to read in about 1975. Mr. Pine's Purple House by Leonard Kessler is the story of a man who lived in a neighborhood full of endless white houses, and he decided to paint his house purple. So, of course, that is a great lesson for young people to learn that it's okay to be different and that it's great to express yourself. Fast forward 40 years. When I was contemplating uh, the idea of running for mayor, I had several consultants to tell me that I needed to fit into a certain mold in order to be successful. Well, by that point, the lessons of Mr. Pine had been ingrained in me for many years. I did my own thing. And after I was sworn in after a hard fought election, I wore this purple suit to my swearing in. But before I ever had a notion of being mayor of a major American city, I was just a shy, quiet teenager uh, growing up in a household and where my parents were involved with a Pentecostal holiness church. And their involvement there made me feel as if I was wearing purple paint every day. I stood out from the other young people because I wasn't allowed to wear pants or makeup or jewelry or go to the movies, or dance, or listen to secular music, or really do anything fun. So I lost myself in the world of books. And during that time period in my life, there were a couple of books that I read that really had a huge impact on me. You can see them here, Gone with the Wind and Roots. I know you're thinking that is a really strange combination, but <laughs> made sense to me. I really was captivated by the uh, historical drama and, of, and the, the backdrop of Gone with the Wind, even though it really was a painful period in American history. I r first read it, I think, when I was in middle school, but then I followed up and kind of balanced out the shame of those slavery days with Roots, the story of one man's insistence on maintaining his identity, which was carried through generations of his family and eventually brought Alex Haley to Africa and brought millions of Americans along with him through both the book and the miniseries. I read both of these books at least five times before I graduated from high school and I now consider them to be part of my DNA. So I arrived at Yale, that's me in the hat there in the background. I arrived at Yale in the fall of 1988, very excited to be in such an intellectual center, uh, but it was uh, an experience that could have been overwhelming, so I tried to stay focused and grounded on what was comfortable for me, continuing to explore my roots, and so I joined the Yale Gospel Choir, and. Uh, 
I first read Native Son by Richard Wright for a class at Yale. Uh, this book's uh, protagonist is a young man named Bigger Thomas, who is a uh, poor Negro growing up on the south side of Chicago in the 1930s. Now, you may be asking why, you know, what does a 19-year-old at Yale have in common with a young, um, young urban male for whom life seems to be a series of closed doors? Well, I can't exactly explain why that story uh, resonated with me so much, but I do recall a few years after college uh, being extremely depressed for several months after Tupac Shakur was shot. To me, he represented the kind of potential loss that Bigger Thomas did as well. And it's so amazing that in 2016, uh, looking back on Native Son, it still speaks so eloquently to issues that we are grappling uh, with today. And it's part of the reason why it was so important for me to accept the president's um, My Brother's Keepers Challenge, uh, which is an effort to improve life outcomes for minority males. As a majority minority city, the, uh, the outcomes and the, Im the trajectory of our minority males here will impact our city's future. And so it, that effort was extremely important for me. God forbid that any young people in San Antonio would actually feel the kind of hopelessness that uh, Bigger Thomas uh, articulated or that Richard Wright articulated through Bigger Thomas in Native Son. With all the discussions that we're having on issues like unconscious bias, uh, police community relations, and the criminal justice system, uh, Native Son remains an extremely, uh, still an extremely relevant read. Now, the other book that I read in college is really in contrast to that, that had a big impact on me, Pride and Prejudice. Now, I, you know, <laughs> it absolutely has no, uh, there's, you know, no correlation between the life that I had at that point or even now. But I read Pride and Prejudice for a class at Yale, and I've been reading it ever since. I think part of it is the romantic in me is drawn to the love story. I'm also um, kind of uh, fascinated by the social conventions, even though when I was reading it, I was forming into a modern educated woman. I still was fascinated by some of those social conventions and rituals though not the part where a woman's fate is determined based on who she marries. Uh, but I will say that as a um, woman working in a non-traditional uh, role, I am asking myself questions all the time about how my gender impacts my ability to be effective in my job. Uh, certainly being small of stature and often soft-spoken, doesn't always engender the kind of confidence people you know, uh, look for in this role, but I will say that not being ego-driven and being willing to uh, reach out to folks who might be naturally inclined to dismiss me often helps me to get the job done. <laughs> uh, Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> Thank you. Pride and Prejudice, I think part of what's so extraordinary about it is that it allows us to root for the underdog and it teaches that lesson that our outcome in life, our life trajectory doesn't have to be dictated by our parents or our social stature. Okay, so after college, I went through the Terry McMillan years. So as a, <laughs> a young black woman, uh, looking for love and trying to figure out my career, Terry McMillan spoke to me. Now, I know for many of you, you think of Waiting to Exhale and How Stella Got Her Groove Back as movies only, but they started out as novels. Novels that had black women protagonists who were asking themselves the same kind of questions that I was asking myself at that stage in my life and mainstream America was taking note of those stories and those voices. Well, since I've been uh, 
a public servant, I haven't had as much time to read novels. Uh, I've been more drawn to books about uh, urban planning, cities, public policy, neighborhood revitalization. I've gotten to be pretty nerdy since I've been on the city council. But uh, in the last five years, I read two books that really, really spoke to me. Uh, the Triumph of the City by Edward Glazer and The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. The Triumph of the City, I would really describe as a new urban planning classic. Uh, you know, a la Jane Jacobs. I mean, it is an amazing analysis of what makes cities vibrant and vital. It's a dissection of the social and physical characteristics of various cities, and um, it just includes so many wonderful ideas about how we can improve our communities. You can see the quote here from Glazer that our culture, our prosperity, and our freedom are all ultimately the gift of people living, working, and thinking together, the ultimate triumph of the city. And so I um, reflect back on many of the ideas that I read about in Glazer uh, as we developed our city's first modern comprehensive plan, which is called Essay Tomorrow. And I am really looking forward to us being able to execute some of the ideas related to sustainability that uh, Glazer proposes in that book. While San Antonio is on an extraordinarily positive trajectory, low unemployment and great job growth, low cost of living in general, I am troubled by the fact that there are many San Antonians that are disconnected from that prosperity, uh, which brings me to the other book that I read in the last few years that had a major impact on me, The Warmth of Other Suns, which um, is an amazing historical, demographical, and uh, group of personal stories of the Great Migration, which for those of you that have forgotten a little bit of your American history, Great Migration refers to that time period between World War I and 1970, where millions of African Americans left the dangerous and oppressive South uh, and relocated to the Northeast, the Midwest, and the West Coast in search of better lives and opportunities. And my family, were part of that movement. Uh, my, um, my parents both left North Carolina and moved to New York City where I was born so that they could have better opportunities. Wilkerson talks about the impact of the arrival of all those millions of people to the cities at that time and how we're still grappling with the aftermath. When I reflect back on my own family's history, I think, God forbid, that uh, young San Antonians would think they have to move somewhere else per uh, permanently in order to uh, connect to prosperity and have better opportunities. And so um, I really do work really hard to ensure that we can uh, reclaim any any talent that we've nurtured here. Going off to college for a few years is fine, but we want our young people to come back here. Wilkerson reflects on the migrants, and um, she says that those who left were probably, on the whole, more ambitious than those that they left behind. And a uh, great quote here from this wonderful uh, book, all told, perhaps the most significant measure of the Great Migration was the act of leaving itself regardless of the individual outcome, the achievement was in making the decision to be free and acting on that decision wherever that journey led them. Now, I would say that yes, we can uh, have that type of freedom, connection to prosperity and opportunity here in San Antonio, but there is still work for us to do. And books can help us to do that. Books can help us in uh, finding common ground and common understanding. They can help to shape us. Uh, they can provide new ideas and allow us to connect to those whose perspectives we've never had the chance to uh, encounter firsthand. Um, Glazer says memorably that our ability to connect with one another is the defining characteristic of our species. He says that in the context of talking about cities, but I deeply believe 
that uh, this applies to books as well, that books make us human. Uh, the stories that I shared a little bit with you, um, the books that had an impact on me today, sharing those types of stories with each other are what allow us to have uh, meaningful connections. Um, and so I uh, truly believe that books can help connect us to each other in a deeper way. And in conclusion, I want to present a call to action, not just a reflection on how books have impacted me, but I think books can help us to shape our future here in San Antonio. So here's what you can do. You can volunteer at our local public libraries or with uh, organizations like Each One Teach One, which is a nonprofit that uh, assists adults who are illiterate. You can donate books. You can mentor through uh, groups like San Antonio Youth Literacy. Of course, you can buy, read, and talk about books. I was so excited to see all the books out on the table when I walked in. I wanted to pause and look through them all. You can join the Mayor's Book Club. Um, you can attend our San Antonio Book Festival. Be a part of making San Antonio a city that reads, a city that connects to each other through books and connects to our bright future. Thank you.